So guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try my best to summarize the whole chapter of effect of an electric current on substances in this particular lesson. So wish me the best. Now, number one, let us start by defining what an electric current is. This is simply the flow of electrons in one direction. So electrons are the negatively charged particles that are found in an atom. So when these move in one direction, you end up having an electric current. Now, when it comes to this, are all substances capable of conducting electric currents? Of course not. Those that are, are referred to as conductors. Those that can't are referred to as non-conductors or insulators. So let us start with conductors. When it comes to solids, all metals are good conductors of electricity. And the reason for this is because they have delocalized electrons. So delocalized electrons are electrons that are free to move randomly within the metallic structure. Now, as they move from one point to another, they conduct the electric current. So this is the reason that makes metals good conductors of electricity. Now, there is also another substance that is not a metal, but also contains delocalized electrons and is as such a good conductor of electricity. And that is graphite. Now, which are the non-conductors? Everything else remaining. So I'm talking about rubber, glass, plastic, etc. All of these solid substances are non-conductors. So if you want to find out whether a substance is a conductor of electricity or not, then you can have such a setup. You're going to place the substance being tested at this point. Now, this setup is going to include a bulb. Now, the bulb is going to let us know whether the substance being tested is a conductor or not. How is it going to do so? By lighting up. So when the bulb lights up, it shows you that the substance is capable of conducting an electric current. When it doesn't light up, then you know the answer for that. Now, what happens in this setup is that when the circuit is complete, you're going to have electrons moving. So the electrons are going to move from the negative terminal there towards the positive terminal. And this is what we mean by saying that the electrons are moving in one direction. So they are going to do so. Now, as the electrons flow through the circuit, they create heat energy. This heat energy is the one that is used to light up a bulb. So if you have a conductor, the bulb lights up. If you don't, then you're not going to have an electric current passing through it. And therefore, the bulb will not light up. So guys, what about molten substances? Are molten substances capable of conducting electricity? Let's break it down. When it comes to metals, yes and yes, metals will conduct electricity whether in solid state or liquid state. So if you have solid sodium metal, yes. If you have molten sodium metal, yes. Because the delocalized electrons that are responsible for conducting the electric current will still be present in either state. Now you're going to have ionic compounds capable of conducting an electric current when in molten state, pause. What are ionic compounds? Ionic compounds are formed when you have a metal reacting with a non-metal. So for example, if sodium metal reacted with chlorine gas, you're going to end up having a product called sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is an ionic compound. Now when ionic compounds are in solid state, what will happen is that they're going to have ions that are in fixed positions. So ionic compounds have ions, these are charged particles. When in solid state, the ions are going to be rigidly held in fixed positions. All they can do is simply vibrate. So they cannot move around and you need to have particles moving around to conduct the electric current. So in solid states, ionic compounds do not conduct electricity. But if you were to take the same ionic compound, melt it, for example, it's going to be capable of conducting electricity. So if you were to take sodium chloride, heat it till it melts, have a setup such as this, then yes, an electric current is going to be conducted. Why? What changed? It's because you freed up the ions. So when the substance melts, 
The ions now become mobile, so they are now capable of moving from one point to another within the structure, and hence they can conduct an electric current. So up to this point, we are going to discuss this setup. Now a setup such as this is used during electrolysis. So electrolysis is a process whereby you're going to pass an electric current through an electrolyte. Now an electrolyte is a substance that can conduct an electric current. So in this case, our electrolyte is molten sodium chloride. Remember what we said about ionic compounds? When they are in molten state, that is when they are in liquid state, they can conduct electricity. So our electrolyte in this case is the sodium chloride, molten sodium chloride. Now, if we were to pass an electric current through this, what will happen is that number one is going to conduct the electric current because it has mobile ions. Number two is that it's going to undergo chemical decomposition. It's going to break down. So this whole process is what is termed as electrolysis. So we also have electrodes. There they are. Now, these electrodes are simply either metal rods or graphite rods. Remember what we talked about initially? When you have solid graphite or solid metals, these are conductors of electricity. So the electrodes are simply here to conduct electricity. So the electrodes have been dipped in the electrolyte in order to complete the circuit by conducting electricity. So you can use either a metal rod or a graphite. But graphite is the one that is preferable for several reasons. Number one is that, yes, it can conduct electricity because otherwise it wouldn't be here. Number two is that graphite is unreactive, so it doesn't react with the electrolyte. And number three is that compared to metal rods, graphite rods are relatively cheaper. So it's a win-win situation. So you're going to have two electrodes. The electrode that is connected to the positive terminal is referred to as the anode. The one connected to the negative terminal is referred to as the cathode. Now, guys, in case you find this confusing, which is the positive one, which is the negative one, I have the perfect solution for you. Panic. Positive is anode. Negative is cathode. And there we have it. Okay, now when the circuit is complete, what will happen? Number one, you're going to have the ions moving around, you know, being mobile, okay? They are going to move in a particular direction. So in this case, we are going to have two types of ions. We are going to have sodium ions and we are also going to have chloride ions, okay? Now, sodium ions are positively charged. Chloride ions are negatively charged. So opposites attract. You're going to have the positively charged sodium ions getting attracted towards the negatively charged cathode, okay? So they're going to move towards the cathode. Now the chloride ions are negatively charged, so they are going to move towards the anode. So on reaching the anode, what will happen to the chloride ions? They are going to lose electrons. They are going to lose electrons to form chlorine atoms. There we have it, okay? So each chloride ion is going to lose one single electron to form a chlorine atom. But I want to say this, when it comes to halogens, that is chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine, etc., these usually exist in form of diatomic molecules. So you're going to have one chlorine atom covalently bonded to another chlorine atom. And that is the reason why when it comes to chlorine, we usually illustrate it as such, Cl2. So we cannot have it being left of a Cl. It's impossible. So what will happen is that one chlorine atom is going to combine with another chlorine atom to form the chloride molecule. So essentially, if we were to combine these two half equations, we will end up having one half equation as such. So two chloride ions are going to lose two electrons, one from each, to form the chlorine molecule, okay? So in this case, what is happening is a type of reaction called oxidation. What is oxidation? This is the loss of electrons. So chlorine are losing electrons. Now, when you talk about losing electrons, these electrons are not simply lost, you know, to the surrounding. Uh -uh. They are going to be conducted from the anode 
towards the cathode. Now, what will happen at the cathode? We are having an influx of electrons. These electrons are going to be gained by the sodium ions. So you're going to have sodium atoms being discharged at the cathode. Now, in order to balance the number of electrons at the cathode and anode, we are going to multiply this half equation by two, such that we end up having two electrons. So the number of electrons being lost at the anode is going to be equivalent to the number of electrons being gained at the cathode. So we are going to have two reactions occurring simultaneously at the same time. These reactions are reduction and oxidation. Oxidation takes place at the anode. Oxidation always, always takes place at the anode. Reduction, that is gaining of electrons, always takes place at the cathode. So this is a redox reaction. Now I have another easy way for you to remember this information. Look at this. Red cut and ox. Red cut reduction is always at the cathode. Oxidation is always at the anode. And there we go. So what are the observations you're going to see in this setup? In this case, at the cathode, you're going to observe a gray solid being deposited. And this, of course, is sodium. At the anode, you're going to observe a green gas. This is chlorine. So this brings us to the end of this fantastic lesson. By the way, how did I do? Do you feel like the information that you've gained in this lesson is now enough for you to have a deeper dive into this chapter? I hope it is. See you next time.